Um, we ask our students to take one colloquium and choose their favorite speaker. And that's how we got uh, Andrea for today. That was the, the student's choice, I might add. Um, Andrea uh, is the Einstein Professor of Physics at CUNY Graduate Center. More importantly, he's a founding director of the Photonics Institute, the Advanced uh, Science Research Center. Um, well, there's a lot to say. Um, he's a director of Simon's Collaborations on Extreme Wave uh, Physics and Phenomena. Um, let's see, he had his degrees mostly at uh, Rome at Trey University, and he was a postdoc at UPenn. Following that, he was a faculty member at uh, UT Austin. Um, he has uh, more awards. I stopped counting at maybe 12, okay? That's one of the biggest ones is, one of the most famous ones is the, um, the NSF uh, Waterman Award. And he got that um, in 2015 for his work in metamaterial theory and design, including insightful contributions to plasmatic cloaking, effective light manipulation in the nanoscale, innovative ideas in breaking time reversal symmetry, being to enhance non-reciprocity from acoustics to microwaves and optics, and unique contributions to metamaterials. Um, let's see, I should stop speaking. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Paul, and thanks to the students also for nominating me. Uh, it's great to be here. Also, we are neighbors. Uh, I'm a few subway stops north in Harlem, uh, near City College, uh, Columbia. So anytime you are in the area, if you like to see some of the experiments I'm going to show you, you are welcome to stop by the lab and, uh, and chat. So uh, what I'm going to show you are a few examples of what we've been doing in the area of metamaterials. Uh, they are uh, engineered materials. Um, geared towards uh, uh, controlling to a uh, large degree the propagation of light and sound waves. And the motivation around this is that uh, these uh, uh, engineered materials can form a very powerful platform for uh, many technologies that use waves. So from uh, radio waves for communications to uh, light waves for energy, sensing, uh, computing, to sound, again, for communications, sensing, imaging, mm -hmm. uh, biomedical uh, applications. All of these rely on uh, controlling and processing uh, waves. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> getting more control over waves can be a very important breakthrough uh, 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 for, for technologies. Uh, what's remarkable is that in all these uh, technologies today, all the devices we use to uh, uh, acquire and transmit waves, we use a quite limited set of materials. And this leads to uh, um, weak wave matter interactions that uh, uh, lead to complexity, to form factors that are very large because uh, the interactions of each individual molecule or uh, 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 subwavelength element with light is very small. So we end up with uh, uh, lenses that to do a good job over the entire uh, visible range have to be much, much larger than the wavelength or even more complicated uh, uh, optical tables that uh, try to uh, uh, do uh, very sophisticated forms of processing of light and that leads to huge form factors. Can we squeeze this down or, or more? Can we realize materials that have a, a, a extreme forms of interactions with light and that we can exploit for various technologies? That's where metamaterials come to play. Uh, metamaterials are uh, uh, structured materials, as you see. As you see in this picture, that are uh, built at the nano scale. Uh, I know some of you come to uh, the Advanced Science Research Center for the clean rooms so with sophisticated uh, nano fabrication facility that can realize uh, this form of. Uh, uh, nanostructures, uh, uh, typically with etching, photolithography, other techniques, we can 
uh, build quite precise arrangements of nanoparticles uh, that uh, uh, provide an emergent form of uh, optical responses uh, that is very different from the constituent elements that form the materials. And you see how in this uh, scenario, uh, symmetries, shapes, geometries, the compositions of the materials all play a role in uh, engineering these new forms of uh, uh, optical responses. And this, as you will see throughout my talk, can be translated also to lower frequencies, to radio frequencies, infrared, mid infrared, and also to sound waves. Um, I want to give you a snapshot of a few things we've been looking at. Um, one uh, that is quite popular in the uh, past 10 years or so is the idea of uh, structuring an aperture, a surface, that also uh, for practical reasons is the easiest thing to pattern if you use lithography techniques. Uh, this is a seminal work from Federico Capasso. Uh, several groups have been demonstrating over the years how if you structure an aperture with the tailored, uh, deeply sub-wavelength uh, nanostructures, you can transform the way in which uh, an impinging wave front is transmitted or reflected. And this allows you to scale a complex optical setup into a very thin layer. 100 nanometers or so. The conventional way in which this is done is uh, uh, through localized resonances. So basically, the idea is very simple. It actually boils down to old concepts in the field of reflector rays, if you're familiar with the antenna technologies. That means that basically, each of these elements on its own has a strong interactions of light because of some localized resonance, like, for example, plasmonic resonances were very popular a few years ago, or dielectric resonances. <laughs> And uh, uh, the idea is that by tailoring uh, pixel by pixel these uh, nanostructures, you can actually imprint a wavefront over the transmitted or reflected data. Uh, this has proven very effective, but it's also shown some limitations. In particular, as you see here, there is actually some trade off between uh, uh, how good of a spatial control we can achieve and uh, how much the spectral response, the response for different frequencies is, is obtained. And the reason is simple. If we try to uh, bring the light down at the nanoscale by tailoring a very strong resonance, then the resonance has its own dispersion. It has to follow Ramestronic, it has to follow the usual causality constraints, and therefore, as the frequency changes, that response is not out of control. And this means that different colors, different wavelengths, uh, get uh, uh, impacted in a way that is not really controllable frequency by frequency. In contrast to this, uh, in the last few years, we've been uh, introducing the idea of actually engaging uh, these uh, apertures with uh, non-locality, with uh, engineering the long-range response of the structures. Basically, the idea is that instead of having a pixel by pixel engineering of the wavefront, we make it more complex by tailoring actually long-range interactions in the aperture. And by doing that, you actually relax those constraints. You can realize uh, quite sophisticated forms of uh, light matter interactions that go beyond what the local metacity <laughs> getting both spectral and spatial control over polarization, phase, amplitude, quality factor of the response, pixel by pixel. Uh, the idea is basically uh, uh, to leverage uh, the physics of gradings, this is what this slide tries to capture. So we start from a highly symmetric structure. This, uh, you see here, it's a unit cell, and then this is repeated periodically. We understand very well how a grading works. It's a very long tradition of studies. And in particular, for our designs, we started from modes in these gradings that are very localized to the surface. In principle, they're actually not radiating. So they are modes that you cannot even engage if you come in from far field. Mm -hmm. Or if you do engage, they, they, you engage them with a very fine line width, only specific resonance, because they... Uh, oh, it's crazy. Uh, they're it's kind of extremely localized. Yeah. Uh, the idea next okay. is... Uh, uh, Mariella? Uh, can you go to the drugstore? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't. Sure. <laughs> Anyways, the, the idea here is to uh, introduce, on at the level of the single unit cell, symmetry-driven perturbations of these uh, highly periodic structures. So 
we start from a very delocalized resonance, for which the individual units are very little to this, really the unicity driven. But then by structuring these unit cells with specific defects, we can outcouple locally this delocalized resonance state. And then you can build completely non-periodic oh. structures in which you pattern degrading resonance arbitrarily in terms of polarization, phase, amplitude, quality factor, uh, uh, pixel by pixel. And that uh, leads to this locally tailored non-local state. Now we'll show you how this paradigm to design an aperture wavefront can lead to a very interesting physics beyond just structuring the wavefront. Uh, first example is actually what uh, can happen when we build a lens based on this. So the, one of the holy grails of this field of metasurfaces is can we take a conventional lens that is bulky, it's many, many wavelengths thick, typically is a, a, a curved structure, and make it into a very thin layer. This has been done many times with local approaches. This is a non-local meta lens. So we start from a grading and we introduce these perturbations that uh, control the phase of the output front to make it parabolic. And this way, at the working frequency, this is 1550 telecom wavelength, you get a nice focus, similar to what has been done before. But different from other lenses, instead of observing the chromatic aberrations, actually the response of the lens disappears. So now the structure becomes transparent out of band because you don't have that delocalized resonance supporting the response. And each of these perturbations is basically zero scattering very, very weak uh, effect. So if you magnify the image, you start seeing some drift, but importantly, you need to really uh, magnify the, the, the intensity to see something. And this makes it uh, ideal if you want to cascade elements, make it multifunctional. So you can tailor different wavelengths without distortions and create multifunctional devices based on these very thin layers of silicon or other uh, dielectric material. Uh, this one is a, a, an example of similar principles, but uh, for uh, radio frequencies, actually millimeter waves. So this is 20 gigahertz. I'm scaling the frequency by orders of magnitude, use very different platforms. In this case, it's a printed circuit board uh, uh, substrates with uh, metallic uh, copper uh, uh, imprints. And the uh, same idea, highly periodic structure with non-periodic perturbations that control the response. And yet, we show indeed uh, quite uh, interesting, uh, highly efficient manipulation of uh, the incoming waves for different polarizations. What we wanted to show here is that you can, first of all, target with 100% efficiency or very close to 100% circular polarized light that is difficult to achieve, to make something that is he heavily, highly uh, scattering for one polarization circular and uh, transparent for the opposite one. And you, indeed, you see that this polarization of uh, electromagnetic waves for this frequency gets focused. This polarization for another frequency interacts only with the third surface and gets beam steered. Each of these functionalities can be arbitrarily encoded in the pattern. And uh, the same polarization, but a different frequency gets uh, into another uh, beam steering. And other wave frequencies just go to. And then these are measurements demonstrating in the beam steering the momentum space on the left, on the right, and focusing, that is a parabolic momentum, is actually real space measurement to show the focusing of the millimeter wave. These are ideal responses for uh, millimeter wave communications at the cellular uh, response. Mm -hmm. uh, this, we go back to optics uh, and shows another opportunity that comes from these technologies. Mm -hmm. This is again for 1.5 millimeter uh, 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 micron uh, uh, telecom wavelength applications. Because these uh, modes are so confined to the surface, there's a really delocalized resonant of the entire aperture, they do not need to be driven from outside, <coughs> from, from free space. They can be driven from guided mode. So with this same technology, you can build the very efficient grading couplers that do arbitrary transformations over the response. So you feed a wave from this waveguide, and then you pattern the structure and you create an arbitrary profile emerging. A typical grading coupler, the best it can do is one polarization without couples to a certain angle. But this one takes uh, all the impinging light and focuses it at the point, forming a Poincare beam. This uh, really shows the, the, the strength of this uh, approach because each element of this surface targets different polarization. And now you see that uh, 
if you observe the focal spot with different polarizers, you see different regions of the focal spot emerge. That means that this is encoding all possible polarization states in one focal spot. This uh, implies a high capacity multiplexing for information. Each polarization can carry a different uh, signal. Again, go back to millimeter waves. This is a technology to realize multiplexing indeed for millimeter waves. Again, it's a printed circuit board structure you feed from one side, and this leaks out. It becomes what in radio frequencies are known as leaky wave antennas, but this is a very sophisticated. They can do a lot more than a conventional leaky wave antenna. Again, for instance, focus in the near field, two different polarizations at two different arbitrary spots, and this again. The, the idea is to make this reconfigurable and uh, be able to target users as they move in, uh, in front of the object. Now, things that we are even more excited about, for now these are uh, interesting applications for technologies, but there are things that fundamentally you cannot do with a local uh, metasurface approach that uh, we are uh, very excited about in the physics uh, fundamental point of view. And uh, in particular, this is uh, the concept of thermal metasurfaces, so taming coherence through these uh, highly delocalized states. The idea is that uh, uh, all the structures I showed you are fed from typically a very bulky source, a coherent laser that uh, shines uh, a wave front on the metasurface or a DNA vector network color analyzer for the millimeter wave experiment. The most ubiquitous form of light, of course, it's uh, thermal. Uh, of course, another very cheap form of light is photoluminescence. Uh, the challenge of this type of sources is that they're highly incoherent. They're very cheap, very easy to access, but they do not, uh, not possess co coherence neither in space nor in time. And therefore, uh, it's very difficult to think of imprinting phase, imprinting amplitude over an incoherent form of oscillations of matter. Uh, about 20 years ago, Jean-Jacques Greffet showed that if you take uh, uh, materials like silicon carbide that are highly resonant, thanks to phonon resonances in the mid-infrared spectrum, in the spectrum in which they can thermally emit, and you pattern their surface with uh, uh, periodic structures, you can actually engage, provide coherence to the beam, to the thermal emission. The idea is that because light is so confined already to the interface between uh, these phononic materials and uh, free space, by patterning this interface, you can scatter out with coherence that uh, thermal emission. And this provides these highly directional beams that uh, can scan with frequency, like a rainbow of, of colors coming out of the thermal emission. Of course, this is still quite limited in the sense that this uh, is limited to one polarization of light, the one for which this surface mode uh, are supported by this interface and uh, to these uh, very symmetric beams because these are incoherent. There is no reason why one direction should be different than the other. In fact, for many years, uh, this uh, has been uh, assumed to be a, a fundamental constraint of reciprocity, the fact that these beams must be uh, symmetric. Yes? So I, I think I'm missing something. So you're showing light goes into a structure and then it comes out at different angles for different wavelengths. But it's, I mean, that's a diffraction gradient, right? Sorry. Uh, what I showed before is, is exactly what you're saying. What I'm showing here is actually a, a, a slab of silicon carbide mm -hmm. that you just heat up. And oh, the so it's, emission, it's emitting. Yes. Oh, okay. The thermal emission looks highly coherent, spatially and temporally. And uh, this was shown originally in this paper by yes. Jean-Jacques Greffet and collaborators. And comes from, I mean, the explanation in this paper is the flat interface, because of this phononic resonance is very strong for ionic resonances is that they support these interface states. If I now pattern the structure through multiple scattering of these interface states, I can actually provide coherence. And that's how I get this. Of course, you would expect from thermal emission very broad uh, incoherent emission. This is much more directional and coherent. But still quite limited. The best you can do is this symmetric beamings like conical emission with a scanning that goes with frequency. Can I change get more access to, to the, that's what we asked, uh, using this uh, meta, non-local metasurface. Can I engineer the non-locality much more than a simple gradient? And to our surprise, we found that uh, not only we can open completely the 
degrees of freedom in control internal emission in terms of spatial coherence, temporal coherence, polarization state of emission, wave front can be completely aperiodic because these structures rely on periodicity. You can make it completely aperiodic and uh, quality factor. But also, we don't need to use phononic materials. In fact, just thin layer of silicon can serve as our emitter. So we'll show you now uh, theory and experiments in which uh, we just structure thin layer of silicon, nothing particularly exciting on its own, backed by ground plane, and uh, we heat it up. And we can structure the emission at will. In principle, we can uh, realize totally aperiodic focusing, orbital angular momentum, and other forms of uh, wavefront shading for thermal emission. The, the emission is at the level of black body emission, but with a, an arbitrary profile of space and frequency. This was a, a theory in a paper in which we explained how this works, how you need to do this, you need both uh, uh, local and non-local engineering of, of the aperture. And these are some designs, uh, numerical demonstrations. So for instance, a spin uh, uh, a beam possessing spin, both orbital and uh, also these are circular polarized, so also polarization spins. Uh, this is a, a lens. But more importantly, these are experiments demonstrating the same principles uh, in, in actual metasurfaces. So these are, for instance, uh, six metasurfaces. These are uh, scanning electron microscope images. And these are measurements demonstrating that you can access uh, arbitrary polarization states across the quantum sphere, in which you can meet. Uh, Close to black body, these are not perfect, but still access about 80% uh, of, of uh, to black body radiation. Of course, the silicon layer itself, it's a very poor thermal emitter at these frequencies. So it's a remarkable enhancement compared to the silicon itself. But also, interestingly, you can make it very polarization selective, and the polarization can be arbitrary, elliptically polarized in other ways across the entire orchestra sphere. Sorry, uh, yes. So, so how should I visualize this experimentally? I, I just put it on a hot plate, sure. and how much do I go up? Or is it like black body. You would see black. So you do it without structure, and you measure very little. Right? Okay. The silicon doesn't right. emit; it's uh, below band gap. Right. But you structure it, and not only you see black body radiation, but you see it polarized arbitrarily. It depends on how you encode your nanostructures. So when we do it with this in an FTR microscope, so we put it on a hot plate, and you measure. These measurements are normal incidence, and now we'll show you also angular spectrum. So we can make arbitrary wavefronts. And the narrowness, basically, that's the thing that you are saying is very coherent. That's exactly. why it's So the, the, this is, shows the temporal coherence, and next I will show you the spatial coherence as well. Uh, by the way, maybe I didn't explain it well. What actually is happening, the matter is still oscillating incoherently, but it uh, populates this highly coherent delocalized state that we structure on silicon, on the aperture. That's, that serves as the bridge to bring it to flat field. So we start on purpose with something that doesn't emit well. And then we populate that with the oscillations of matter that come from heat. And the similar principles can be applied to photoluminescence. Yes, please. What are the design principles? How do you... Yeah, it's all rational. It's I'm very... sure it's rational. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly, uh, I mean, mostly it's, uh, by the way, uh, I have to say that uh, I'm uh, on, in the minority here because uh, metasurfaces now, it's all about machine learning and uh, <laughs> image design and uh, topology optimization. This is all rational. So uh, I... I mean, is it just a bunch of Fourier transforms or...? No, no, no. no. These are based on... Uh, the, the principle is what I explained. So we start from a highly periodic structure, like a like graphene, but then we introduce symmetry control perturbations of this grain. So you want to have the perturbations in specific locations that do not affect this delocalized mode, or, or affect minimally. And also that uh, these perturbations affect in the same way across the aperture. So it, it's a careful design. It's not... Uh, actually, people sometimes, uh, when they've seen our theory papers, have contacted us to ask, it doesn't work. And then we tell them, because you are affecting the mode, you need to be careful where you put this perturbation. It's not... Uh, just a random, uh, you, you place the perturbation here to access the specific polarization and it works. It's very easy to perturb them all, so you need to be careful. We build the libraries, basically, of these uh, unit cells to target. And you will see in a moment more sophisticated, you, know, you only see polarization in these 
So here you only see, so these angles are controlling what polarization you. Yeah, but I want to know how to design it myself. Absolutely, <laughs> the, the, all the recipes are in the papers. <laughs> so you just need to be careful at reading them, but <laughs> it's, it's all, we don't uh, hide anything, it's all there. And in fact, there are many different symmetry classes you can, symmetry groups you, you can exploit for this. But you need to be careful how you do it. Yeah. I have a question. So in order to create a circular repolarized, right, you need to break the time reversal symmetry, right? So then you put some magnetic impurity or something to break the time reversal or something else? Excellent question. So uh, there, there was it, there were several papers in the literature claiming mm -hmm. that you need to break reciprocity to uh, emit the circular polarization or to emit asymmetrically in opposite directions. So this is actually not true. Mm -hmm. In fact, we proved it uh, in this PRX paper. That you, you don't need to break the universal symmetry to admit the uh, And we have also proved experimentally, and in the, uh, I mean, this shows that here there is no time universal symmetry breaking. It's literally a piece of silicon that we hit up. And we can emit clearly spin polarized, we can provide it. By the way, a, a byproduct of these experiments is that our surface is actually emitting spin. So it has to have a recoil. We don't measure that, but actually, as it emits, it should spin if it were left in free space. So, of course, I mean, there should be a recoil because of the conservation of right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, can you do something like acoustically levitate it, heat it up, and uh, and make it spin? Oh, it would be wonderful. And I know that some of you are working on this glove. In fact, I have other ideas related to this levitation that I would love to discuss. It would be Quite interesting to observe. or maybe within outer space, maybe that's <laughs> interesting. But yeah, for now we don't have the tools yet in, in the lab. But it would be very interesting to to say on the So this is obviously very cool that this is a kind of piece of silicon. But if I didn't care about that, and I said I have a thermal source, and I'm allowed to use lenses and Absolutely. ratings and wave plates and all of this, is there anything this does that I couldn't do with a more extended thing, or is it just more compact? Excellent question. Uh, in fact, the first figure of this uh, PRX paper shows exactly this. So it shows a stack. We start from black body, we put filters, we put uh, polarizers, we plates, uh, spatial light modulators. We can get the, the same output in principle. A few things that this, uh, I mean, one thing is the whole metasurface business has been about compactification. So one thing is that instead of building an optical table, you can build it in one surface. The other one is efficiency, actually. Uh, I would argue that it's very difficult to get black body out through a stack of many things, and also you are wasting a lot of the emitted energy. By the way. Each of these stage is actually rejecting. This thing is very different. We start from something that doesn't emit, and we open a channel, and that emits a black body. So, in that sense, if you care about preserving the heat, well, when we published the theory paper, some uh, DOD people contacted me, they wanted to use this for uh, thermal management. But actually, this is the opposite. It doesn't cool. <laughs> it's not presenting it. It's only emitting one thing very well. It opens a channel, but it's not. If you want to cool, there are better ways of doing that. Uh, so this is what uh, we envision it for sophisticated sources. And this same principles apply to photoluminescence. Maybe. The same. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, when uh, somebody mentioned the recoil of the spin, yeah. does that mean that when you heat up the material, all the um, emitted spins are all in the same direction? Yes. And I so, mean, you can make them that way or you can pattern them arbitrarily. And so the control for that is the way that you pattern exactly. the, the yeah. holes on top. Exactly. Okay. So the other mm -hmm. thing that we've done is to introduce this concept of geometric phase. I think before uh, today we were discussing this with some of you. Geometric phase is a very powerful tool to control uh, through rotations. I was talking about the uh, role of symmetries. Through rotations, uh, the phase of the output response. And it's been widely used for metasurfaces, metasurface design. The basic principle is if I start from a resonance structure that is, has some broken symmetry, and I illuminate it externally with a circularly polarized wave, as I rotate that resonance, I can control, it's, it works like a delay for, for like a wave that has a spin that can be delay or, or advance. So I can control the phase without affecting the resonance. So that has been very useful for metasurface surface design. What is highly counterintuitive is that we can actually bring this concept of geometric phase to incoherent light. So this, we call it thermal geometric phase. That, see, these are the unit cells we bring. And as you see, those things are 
rotated, and each of these elements maintains a high degree of circular polarization, but it spans the phase across two bytes. This is actually the recipe to build an arbitrary pattern of the output by putting together this. And remember, these perturbations are studied to not interact with each other, to not affect each other, so you can actually pattern the entire structure preserving that resonance. They, they happen around this critical point here. It's a singularity in parameter space that is what allows us to radiate a black hole. That's one more question, yeah. sir. So if, if that's a response function, yeah. Um, is it inversible? Can I make another thing and put it on top and get exactly what I put in back? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. So you can correct uh, for sure to so complement. Linear or non-linear, or it doesn't matter. These are all linear. These are non-linear, linear, but inversible. Of course, uh, uh, I mean I, I don't have time to discuss this, but we have a lot of interest in adding nonlinearities here. We've done a lot of work on nonlinear mirror surfaces, uh, and uh, in fact. Uh, the two things we're exploring at the moment are adding to this platform nonlinearities and temporal modulations, because uh, these tools allow you to potentially to emit more than black body. Right now, we're limited to the black body emission, uh, or uh, to emit uh, in uh, very counterintuitive oriented ways. For instance, uh, have, uh, right now, these metasurfaces emit as much as they absorb in the same mode, but by using nonlinearities or using uh, temporal modulations of these structures, for instance, through optical pumping, you can actually break those constraints. You can make a surface that absorbs something but emits something completely different. So these are uh, experiments demonstrating, indeed, that those papers that you were mentioning about the reciprocity are wrong. <laughs> we, here we are emitting, actually, these measurements emitting, and these are theory, of course, uh, it's not as clean, but clearly we have, in this emission, and largely asymmetric. So all previous demonstrations of some coherent form of thermal emission is always symmetric. In fact, it was argued that this was a constraint of time reversal symmetry. Instead, here we have a, 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 a narrow, this, the quality factors here are larger than 100. So it's highly coherent uh, emission at an angle from the interface and no emission for the other and also for one handedness and not the other. So this is the kind of most uh, difficult in terms of the uh, challenges for thermal emission control. And again, this surface has recoil in rotation and also in momentum, by the way. If it emits that way, it must recoil the other way. So it will experience also transverse recoil. Uh, this one is even more sophisticated because we can imprint patterns. So here, what we have shown is that you can introduce the concept of geometric phase uh, for thermal light, not just for circular polarization, but for arbitrary polarization. And for instance, realize devices that uh, discriminate polarizations. This is called the Rajba effect. And uh, indeed, we have uh, different uh, orthogonal polarizations with arbitrary, uh, they, they can be elliptically uh, polarized that go in separate directions uh, across uh, the, the angular spectrum. So have high spatial coherence, high spectrum, Spectral coherence and arbitrary polarization states. Another thing that we've been working on is uh, the concept of uh, using non local metasurfaces for computing. And this is actually quite natural because, uh, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we can uh, engineer basically this transfer function. We have uh, an input here and an output here that can be controlled through a wide range of properties. Of course, as long as it's linear, the frequency is conserved. But uh, the spectral response, it's naturally uh, adaptable for uh, computing. And uh, several years ago, now 10 years ago, actually, we wrote this paper together with Nederengheta and uh, uh, Vincenzo Galdi, in which we argued that it may be possible to engineer metamaterials to perform mathematical operations on, on an arbitrary image. And now we have many experiments that actually rely on this non-locality engineering. So now what I'm going to show you next are a, a bunch of metasurfaces that are highly periodic in space, but manipulate the momentum content of an image and do, for instance, uh, edge detection. That's uh, kind of the most uh, uh, useful for applications. These are uh, very useful for uh, object detection neuromorphic imaging and self-driving cars, all these 
tools in which you want to simplify an image to detect it, to, to classify it. Uh, and these tools are very useful, like tailoring the response in momentum space, basically it's what you need to do this type of uh, uh, Fourier optics on a thin film, on 100 nanometer thin surface. So this was uh, uh, one of the first designs we did, it's actually less than a year ago, uh, but uh, uh, it's based on this uh, frequency response around, uh, again, 1550, it's a piece of silicon again, and we tried to create this uh, low-pass filter, sorry, high-pass filter in momentum space, highly symmetric, so hexagonal lattice, and uh, indeed these are measurements, so you feed an image, uh, this is a 100 nanometer thin film, you slice it anywhere in the path between your objective and your image, and you just see edges. And this was designed to be more or less polarization independent. So any polarization, even unpolarized light, shows just the edges. And this happens at the speed of light. You just look through. The same way when you wear uh, sunglasses, you see one polarization, right? Now you see one momentum. You only see high momentum components of your image. That these are the edges. This is a, in, another design in which we improve the bandwidth. So now we have continuous bandwidth of about 5 terahertz over which we see edges continuously for arbitrary polarized light. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, this is actually relevant where you place the, the meta surface, right? It's a very thin film. You can the, place it on top of the CCD. You just see edges. Mm -hmm. um, this is another one, yes, it's 5 terahertz. Uh, for, again, for arbitrary polarized, but we also show that we can design encoding this polarization selectivity. And that's useful to actually uh, um, simplify complex images. Uh, this we can use the concept of polarization sensing for, uh, for polarization imaging to, to uh, enhance certain edges. So this is another meta surface in which we kill on purpose one polarization, not the other. And you see how as we change now the polarization of the input light, we highlight only the edges oriented parallel to the polarization. So we can selectively enhance some edges uh, as we change the polarizer in front of the meta surface. If we add feedback to this, we can build uh, more complicated surfaces now because the, the, the target operation is, is more complex, but they do arbitrary mathematical calculation. On, on an image. So in general, this is a, a, a metasurface that solves a, an equation, an integral differential equation. It encodes the kernel of this equation here. This is a Fredholm integral equation. The input is here. The solution is the g, the function g that is inside the integral and outside. By adding feedback, you can basically build this equation through optics. The feedback is basically a partially reflecting interface. So now you illuminate it from one side with multiple beams, and then you read after a few bounces of light. So this goes in maybe 10 cycles of, of light, so extremely fast, you get the solution of your problem. And you can read it in the scattering from the meta surface. And these are calculations and the ideal response you would expect for different inputs. You need to get what you expect. Another thing we're doing at the moment is actually event detection. So I showed you how you can do edge detection in space. You can also do edge detection in time. And this, uh, instead of building high pass filters in momentum, we can build high, high pass filters in frequency. So around a central frequency, that's the target function you want. You, you generally build this type of operation. And this operation means that I don't see anything in the surface if the image is static. If something changes, I see the edges. So it does a derivative in space and time at the same time. This again, it's a completely passive surface, right? It's just the design, the dispersion engineering of the meta surface. And this can be done by structure. So this is again in the spirit of neuromorphic computing. This is this, how the structure looks like. The, you want to highlight these corners. This approximates very well that operation. It's again a silicon surface. And these are what uh, uh, you find in terms of, uh, this is 1D images, but they appear and disappear. And indeed, uh, you find corners wherever the, the object appears. Even something that moves in time, you see different intensities as a function of the speed. And the speed that is the brighter is by design. It's uh, 
basically how uh, depending on, on the ratios between the, the bandwidth in frequency and the bandwidth in momentum. Tell us, maybe this is something not but if electromagnetism is second order in derivatives and you are doing some Fourier <coughs> propagation of light, how can you have higher <coughs> derivative terms in what you want to solve if the theory has if you write it in Maxwell, has only two derivatives either in time and space. How can you have higher orders if you're only doing light stuff? So in general, with this property, you can do arbitrary linear operations. Anything linear, you can encode it in the dispersion. Uh, the second order, yes, it comes from Maxwell's equations, but that, that's a, the natural diffraction. But the issue is that here there is scattering at play. We are trapping light, and the way we bounce light transversely across the surface determines the operation you perform. And it, this can be happy as long as it is linear. We are working also on nonlinear operations that become even more interesting. But this requires, that's a limitation of uh, actual equations in the linear media. Uh, so everything we do here has to be linear. So it, you could, in, in the spirit of the question I got before, this you could do similar principles with the Fourier optics, Fourier 4F system, for instance. With the caveat that the 4F system, apart from being very bulky, it's four focal lengths, two lenses, is very sensitive to alignments. This one is all compactified into one engineered surface. But in principle, see, I mean, uh, we, we, we can build, in fact, this is the experiments for this event detection, right? It build up, you only measure when things change. And uh, this is secondary in, in time and, and space. But uh, the you, we can build something similar. In fact, it has been done using a whole optical table with the gratings, the pulse shapers, and you, you can do similar things. This happens in a very thin engineered surface. So you can integrate it easily into the uh, But I think I'm uh, running late, and I'm glad that we uh, have all these discussions. So maybe uh, I, I will uh, probably skip this and uh, show you. I want to show you something about time, and we we're discussing about time. So maybe we we'll skip a few slides. I wanted to show you what we're doing on polaritons, but I'm happy to discuss uh, another time and on acoustic waves. But I wanted to show you these recent uh, uh, experiments on uh, on time metamaterials, and it connects well with what we were just saying about time metamaterials. Yes. Um, for the metamaterials, um, what when you place it uh, to replace the optics? Um, of course, it matters, I guess, um, where in the beam. Does it matter the particular distances, or it just needs to be between? Yeah, it, it can be anywhere in the path. In fact, we do these experiments. We move it anywhere. It could be just in front of the object, or just in front of the CCD, or anywhere in between. That's a big advantage compared to 4X system, in which has to be exactly the middle focal plane. Otherwise, you don't see any. And is the metamaterial sufficiently uniform that its positioning perpendicularly to the beam doesn't really matter? Or does that depend on the meta surface? So right now, the, 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 this design has to be, the, the, the constraint you have should be parallel to the beam. But that's not difficult to do because you already have the CCD. So you can put it just on top of the CCD, it's fine. Then if the CCD moves, it's fine too. Just move it together. Right. But uh, if your uh, metasurface is at 45 degrees compared to the CCD and the image, you will not get this. Right. Because now the, the direct path will go through. The, the key to do derivative is to kill the average. And that's done at normal incidence. So if you tilt it by a lot, you lose it. Actually, if you tilt it already by probably 10 degrees, you lose this. And if it maintains normality, but you move it around, it's no, no, that's completely transverse invariant. OK. This, these uh, structures do not have any spatial because the image is arbitrary, so you cannot make it spatially inhomogeneous. It's all completely periodic, different than the non-local metasurface showed before, in which we introduce a spatial patterning. They, they both rely on local modes, but in this case, we do not want to spatially pattern the local mode. We want to pattern in momentum space. Okay. Thank you. Great question. So the last thing I want to briefly show you is our work on these uh, uh, time metamaterials. So right now, a lot of the stuff you, are, you have seen is relying, as we were saying, on scattering from boundaries. We engineer these boundaries to control wave dynamics, or wave uh, no locality. Uh, if I try to explain in, in a word what uh, a, a, this scattering is, I can use a very simple picture. This, uh, a, a diagram with space and time, 
This is a wave traveling at velocity c. When it hits a one-dimensional boundary, I get reflection, refraction, second boundary, some other reflection, some other refraction, and this follows Fresnel's law. The most classical uh, thing that we all experience is when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we see our face. When we talk in front of a mountain, we hear the echo of our voice. Now, uh, there is a dual of this phenomenon for time. Because uh, Maxwell's equations are dual between space and time, we can think of uh, the uh, uh, analog in time of these reflections and transmissions that are called the temporal reflections and transmissions. The idea is now that the medium, instead of changing uh, abruptly in space, changes abruptly in time, but homogeneously in space. And when this happens, the momentum is conserved in the system because spatial symmetry is preserved, but frequency can change. And the, the change in frequency to conserve momentum implies uh, either time refraction that uh, couples to a new frequency abruptly, or time reflection, in which you couple to the negative of that frequency. That means uh, very broadband phase conjugation for all frequencies without distortion. The, the effect is explained here in a kind of sketch. This, this arrow is time, by the way. Sometimes I'm asked, how do you see the back? This is time. So what you see is a change of color. So suddenly you see another color. All colors are flipped by the same actually ratio. And uh, you see the back of that signal because the signal starts traveling backward. Or in other words, you see this. And this is extremely broadband. In fact, it's frequency agnostic. Any frequency gets the same uh, principle, and assuming that this is a delta function in time. So can we observe this? Uh, this, by the way, was originally predicted uh, 60 years ago by Morgan and Thaler. Many theory papers over many years. There has been uh, one experiment for water waves uh, about uh, uh, six, seven years ago by Matthias Fink in France. Uh, we were able to do the first experiment for uh, electromagnetic waves with uh, a very controlled experiment. So we can do many things with it. And I will show you a few examples of things we, we are doing now with these uh, time interfaces. Uh, it was not trivial to, to achieve this, and that's why it took so long before it was observed. Uh, the reason I was uh, discussing with the students before is due to this, uh, you need three ingredients to see strong time reflections. One is that the thing is done uniformly in space. Like a, in a regular mirror, you want the mirror to be flat, to see a good image. This one has to be done uniformly in space, preserve momentum. The second is uh, that there is a large contrast in impedance from before and after the interface. The same way in which if you want to see a good image of yourself in a mirror, you want that the mirror is metallic, it's something very different than the impedance of air. If you try to see yourself in a glass, don't see much reflection. And the third is that it has to be done abrupt. Because uh, the same, again, spatial analogy, if I try to look in a mirror that gradually goes from air to, to metal, it will absorb everything. You want this to be sharp interface. And unfortunately, optical materials, or electromagnetic materials, don't like to change very fast and by a lot. Either you change very fast a little bit, or you change by a lot, but slowly with no linearity. So the trick we used is to build this, uh, actually this is the experiment. It's a very long uh, transmission line. It's a one dimensional propagation, six meters long. that is meandering in this PCB. And then we plug a lot of switches, ultra fast switches, that uh, can trigger very fast, connect or disconnect to something else. And what we connect and disconnect is extra matter. It's like adding matter or subtracting matter very fast <coughs> from the propagation. If you do it uniformly across the entire medium, you can change by a lot the impedance very fast. And that's what you need to get. So then you can observe this. These are measurements in time. This is the input at the input port. We switch and we get back the output. What you see is that the signal is stretched in time because we have converted all frequencies. We have actually halved all frequencies. And you see that the large peak arrives before the low peak. So we're inverted without, without distortion. All frequencies have been, uh, the relative intensity have been preserved. And this is time refraction. So this is the same input, but stretched in time. 
If you do the Fourier transform, you can observe indeed that there is no distortion. All frequent, this is a, it's better to think in terms of momentum. But of course, they're related, but momentum is what is preserved. All momenta are uh, uh, reflected and refracted with a, a non dispersive way, and the frequency is half instantaneously. So this is a very, very uh, fast, efficient way to convert frequencies broadband. Yes. Um, sorry, so incident is a beam of light and uh, transmitted is also, but if it's temporally reflected, are we violating causality or what's oh, that's a great forward? question. Yes, but that's why if you look at this diagram, that's a good question that already the students had asked. The, the time reflection happens in the new medium. You cannot violate causality. So that's a fundamental difference between a space reflection that happens in the first medium and the time reflection that happens in the new medium. So it's time reversed, but it's in the future. Unfortunately, we cannot bring it back to the past. <laughs> and so physically, it's also light, but yeah. um, it, it's basically it an extreme like... bandwidth broadband phase conjugation. Right. Okay. It, phase conjugation is very useful operation, of course, for many uh, domains, and uh, this is typically done either nonlinearly or parametrically for selected frequency. One frequency you invert phase. This is happening at one instant in time for all frequencies. But you get the same effect. So all the frequencies get phase conjugated. So you get the time reversal. And so this happens as soon as you enter the medium because you're doing the temporal reflection. Exactly. As okay. soon as you switch, all the frequencies get phase conjugated. Yeah. And all by the same uh, strength, so they preserve, there is no distortion. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I know I'm running out of time. I just want to say, because in this audience, I know there is also a lot of interest in, in, in quantum optics. We're studying now the implications for quantum uh, Elements, for instance, these time interfaces can provide the uh, generation of photons from vacuum. This is, for instance, uh, uh, an initial state that has n and zero. So for zero, zero, you see that you can actually create, there is non-zero probability of creating photons, of controlling the, the um, uh, state, the statistics. Of, of, uh, of photons uh, through time interfaces. And uh, I will dive into this a bit more when we make it a bit more complex. So now we'll go back to our classical platform. This is the second experiment we did. Naturally, after we did one time interface, let's do two. We create uh, what is known as a temporal Fabry Perot. Uh, this is a classic Fabry Perot, ma multiple reflections and transmissions. Here you get a temporal Fabry Perot in which by controlling the, di the, the temporal distance between the two interfaces, you get uh, uh, interference between transmitted and reflected beams. And then you get uh, similar things that you would get in a regular Fabry Perot, but now there is no spatial structure, and here you are filtering momentum instead of filtering uh, frequency. <clears throat> so you can control the duration of the temporal slab to cancel, for instance, reflection, like you would do with an anti reflection coding in, in a spatial slab. Is there a relationship that I need to satisfy between the frequencies they want to propagate and the velocity of the switch? Does it have to be much faster than the period of the light? Absolutely. What is the concern? What is the delimitation? Exactly. So this is frequency <coughs> agnostic if you assume it's a delta function. If you assume that the switch has a, a finite temporal duration, then it's frequency agnostic from DC. The higher frequency is about uh, uh, the frequency for which quarter of the period is uh, the time constant of the switch. There is actually rapid transition. Then you don't observe any reflection. The same way I was telling you, if I have a mirror that is not uh, abrupt, right. when I, I start feeling the, the interface, then I, I start losing the reflection. Transmission still works. Right? Time refraction is very lenient. You can do it very slow. As long as you preserve momentum by doing it spatially uniform, you can transform a frequency very efficiently, but you lose reflection. And uh, what is very interesting in this physics is to actually exploit the interference of reflection and transmission, and you start adding interfaces. So without reflection, many of these things you don't observe. The, the one thing we're doing right now, I don't have slides, it's to do time crystals. Right? Time crystals is if you do it periodically in time, then you start seeing all these interferences. But you need time reflections to observe the nice physics of time crystal. For instance, in a regular crystal, you get frequency band gaps. Here you get momentum band gaps. Momentum band gaps amplify waves. You can extract energy from the 
switching. But this you need time reflections. So you need to do it fast. If you don't do it fast, it doesn't work. This is actually what we call our calculations of the statistics of the photons. If you start playing with this interference, you can create a maximized probability of certain number of photons or minimize the probability. And I want to show very briefly, this is a new work we just published in which we demonstrated that if you run now two waves against each other and you run a time interface, you can realize the analog of a mechanical collision but uh, for, for photons. So you, we call it photonic collision. So basically, you have two waves coming against each other, you trigger a time interface and you can control the degree of uh, the way in which the photons interact. As you know, without uh, uh, these interfaces, uh, uh, photons go through each other without inter interacting. Right? They interfere locally, but they go through each other because they're bosons and they're charged. The time interface gives that kick that uh, allows them to exchange energy linearly. And you can pump energy in the system, subtract energy. So we have, we have experiments demonstrating this, that by playing with the delay between the pulses, we can control the total energy in the system after the time interface. Uh, these are, for instance, two examples, simulations of the same uh, excitation, but flipping the phase of one of them, so delaying by a little bit. Then you get, uh, in one case, uh, constructive, like you get energy out of the time interface. In the other case, you completely annihilate one of the two pulses. So very different outputs. And uh, let, let me close here, but we did the experiments, we demonstrated that this happens in our board. This builds up to do towards time crystals and other uh, fancy opportunities. And uh, needless to say, we can do this also for, uh, for quantum uh, phenomena, so for two photons. And it has a very interesting effects for squeezing light and other uh, opportunities that uh, are not available for, for classical waves. Anyways, let me close here. I just gave you a flavor of uh, this platform of metamaterials, how it can manipulate in powerful ways uh, light. Most of my talk was about light, heat, radio waves. I didn't have the chance to show much about sound. I had a few slides on that, uh, but a lot of acoustic waves as well, nano optics, polaritonics, uh, quantum phenomena, and even uh, static uh, mechanics. And uh, I thank you for the attention, my group, and the uh, funding agencies. Thank you. Yes. Yes. In the final part of the presentation, you mentioned about this energy transfer between two waves. Is it still in a re linear regime or? Yeah, it's, oh, okay. It's not non-linear. It's regime. all linear for now, yes. But I of see. course, uh, I mean, you work on this floquet. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you understand very well that uh, these systems, uh, you are, so if you change permittivity, impedance, index of refraction in the presence of fields, mm -hmm. You, you can subtract or add energy. You need energy or you can subtract energy from the system as a function of, of the moment in which you do it. Mm -hmm. So these are parametric <coughs> phenomena that are ultra broadband, basically. We trade, so the typical setup of like Floquet matter is to do it with, you drive it for a long time, right, right, right. very weakly, typically. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, the period determines, you can do a lot to a certain frequency. This is the opposite regime. We do it very strongly, but one cycle. Just hit. But you can provide a lot of energy to the system or subtract. And this depends on when you do it compared to the, the fields at that moment. In fact, I had a slide that I skipped, in which I, I, I'm arguing this one. In principle, if you run two waves, that's what our experiments are doing, that have the same intensity, you have a standing wave, right? If you, if you hit the time interface, when the electric field is zero, there is a moment, every period, or two moments actually, every period in which the electric field is identically zero. You hit the time interface there, you do 100% frequency conversion to an arbitrary frequency without any energy cost. Because it costs nothing to change the index of refraction without fields. If you do it instead when the fields are maximum, then you can impart a lot of energy or subtract a lot of energy, depending if you increase or decrease the index of refraction. I see. So there are a lot of tools here at, at disposal. Of course, this is under the assumption that you can change the index by a lot. So mm -hmm. as you saw, what we've done experimentally is done at low frequencies, where 
We have these tricks, for instance, of switches that are extremely powerful. Doing this in optics would be amazing. And uh, the question is what uh, materials, what... Uh, I think this is going to be kind of a pump probe, like immediately change the refractive index by artificially like... Yeah, I mean, they, they, they are... Uh, they ch I mean, totally agree, we've been already uh, looking at this, but challenges, you have to do it by lot. So how much can you change index or refraction? Mm -hmm. nice. Right now, as I said, in one instant in time, we change, we double index or refraction, or half. So 100% change. That's difficult to do in a linear optics. But there are ways, for instance, uh, Dimitri Basso, for instance, has shown very nice some probe terrets on graphene that actually shows uh, changes in the band structure that are in the order of what we do. So this could be an avenue, at least to push it up to terrets. Uh, I mean, if you have ideas, we'd love to discuss more. But, sure, yes. Yeah. <laughs> some people are looking at ITO, for instance, polaritonic materials. Right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it sensitive to temperature? In the sense that they are propagating light, and I mean, and, and if you switch that, you I mean, to have different frequency at the beginning, at the end, you have to either give energy to the system or take it out. Are you sensitive to the environment? We do the experiments, or, a, or on regular temperature, we can do this. Uh, these experiments are all done at uh, room temperature, it's very simple, classical. But yeah, if you think, for instance, of doing it with superconducting yeah. circuits, then of course, you will need the right uh, temperature to do it. And there are, I mean, then you can go to the quantum regime that we don't have access right now. But this uh, stuff I showed, it's all done in very simple. Uh, in fact, as, as I said, you are welcome to come to the lab. These things we can literally do in front of you. It's not difficult to do. Questions? OK, thank you. Thank you.